Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, Turkey. It's not the economy, but an economic miracle in jeopardy. Long seen as the model for bailout delinquents and the rest of the Arab world, but could the street protests spread beyond politics? Also this week, Thailand's currency on a roller coaster ride. Will the central bank step in to calm things down, or will exporters just have to fend for themselves? An Airbus takes on Boeing as the next generation of planes take flight. We're at the Paris Air Show talking to the plane makers and the buyers. So with the protests in Turkey unfolding over the past few weeks, we've been thinking about what it might be doing, both short and long term, to the Turkish economy. Remembering Turkey was the beacon of light for nations emerging from the Arab Spring with its democratic traditions and an economic miracle which rose from more than five decades of IMF bailouts and loans. But could the street protests undermine a decade of stellar growth, the timing of which couldn't have been worse, with growth already slowing and the US Federal Reserve contemplating turning off a supply of cheap money? Have a quick look at this. It started as an environmental protest. People who didn't want an Istanbul park turned into a shopping mall. What it became has had an impact far beyond that. Turkey's image, its economy, they're both at risk from a growing protest movement and the government's heavy-handed response to it. The stock market saw its biggest drop in a decade. Yields on some government bonds jumped as much as 2% in less than a month. And the Turkish lira fell to an all-time low against the dollar, prompting the central bank to intervene. Sensing the risk to his economy, Prime Minister Erdogan was in no mood to negotiate. The interest rate lobby exploited my nation for years, but no longer. I am telling this to whomever. One bank, two banks, three banks. You have started this fight, you will pay for it. Those who try to bring the stock exchange down, we will throttle you. It's the biggest challenge to Erdogan's 10-year reign, a time which has seen exceptional economic growth and strong support at the ballot box. Inflation's come down from 30% to 6.6%, exports up from $36.2 billion a year to $153 billion, and GDP per capita, which was $3,492, is now up above 10000 But the protests have started at a time when Turkey's economy's begun to slow, there are concerns the U.S. Federal Reserve may end its bond-buying program early, and the economy as a whole only grew 2.2% last year, down from 8.5% in 2011. The simple story is that so much of Turkey's success depends on foreign investment and cash. If those investors get spooked by the protests and the government's reaction to them, then Turkey's economic future won't be in its own hands. And so not surprisingly, the Turkish government's been trying to soothe those nervous investors. Here's the country's finance minister appearing on Al Jazeera last week, speaking of, quote, no significant impact from the demonstrations. Well, so far, the fallout from demonstrations has been quite limited. But if it is sustained, of course, there will be some implications for tourism industry. But there is obviously uh, clear evidence that uh, events are subsiding and uh, chances are there won't be any meaningful uh, permanent damage. Um, you associated the fall in the stock exchange with events, but that was more likely to be driven by Fed's change in rhetoric of the Fed regarding quantitative easing. So actually, if you look at the more of what happened over the past week, uh, there has been very limited outflows from equity market, very limited or negligible outflows from bond market. Uh, you're talking about, you know, roughly about 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars compared to inflows, net inflows over, over the last 12 months of 24 billion dollars. Well, let's analyze all that, shall we? Off to Istanbul and Inan Demir, who is the chief economist at Finansbank. And Inan, we hear the Turkish finance minister there talking about no significant impact from the protest. Would you agree with that assessment or is it perhaps you know, a little bit too generous of a, of a description? 
Well, uh, depending on uh, from which perspective you're looking at it. I, I mean, if you look at the direct impacts, I think the uh, cost of these protests have been in the neighborhood of 100 million Turkish liras, which is very small compared to a Turkish GDP of one and a half trillion uh, liras. But then uh, also uh, we might see some indirect impacts. And uh, on that count, I think the uh, most important reason to worry or to be concerned is Turkey's large external financing needs. Turkey is facing uh, about uh, $160 billion of external debt to be rolled over in the next 12 months, uh, which means uh, Turkey will be very much dependent on investor sentiment uh, towards the country. And uh, if the investor sentiment uh, is uh, to be negatively affected by what has uh, gone on recently, uh, then uh, the uh, rollover costs could increase and that could have some negative impacts on Turkish economy. Mm. Uh, as I said, this is the indirect impact and potentially it could be larger than the direct impacts, which, uh, as I said, we, uh, could be calculated at around 100 billion Turkish liras. Uh, but it remains to be seen uh, whether these indirect effects will materialize. We need uh, some more time to be uh, more confident about the size of those, those effects. Right, so are we seeing a feature of the Turkish economy being exposed here? I mean, it's good to have foreign investment, obviously, and it's good to have companies who want to come to where you are, Istanbul, and want to come to Ankara and do their business. However, it takes some of the control away, doesn't it? And, and it exposes the Turkish economy at a time like this. That's, that's certainly true, that's certainly true. The uh, capital inflows, as long as they are continuing to flow in, are a good thing, supporting growth, uh, boosting employment and everything. Uh, but uh, at times of concerns regarding the sustainability of those flows, of course, uh, the uh, amount that you owe uh, to uh, foreign investors uh, can, be a, can be a significant source of worry. And uh, the uh, problem uh, would have materialized anyway uh, with concerns regarding uh, Fed's tapering off of uh, asset purchases later uh, in 2013. And uh, the heightened domestic political tension just adds to those worries, definitely. The fact is, you know, and even before these protests started, the Turkish economy was starting to slow down, wasn't it? Now, in your opinion, how big a problem is this slowdown? Is it becoming, you know, a more acute issue made worse by these protests? Well, uh, in, in fact, Turkish economy slowed down very remarkably, particularly in the second half of last year. And the first quarter of this year showed uh, initial signs of a recovery. Weak, though, uh, there was a recovery in place in the first quarter. And it was showing uh, signs of gaining further momentum in the uh, beginning of the second quarter. But uh, the second quarter is ending on a sore note uh, because of the uh, protests and the, uh, and the uh, worse global sentiment uh, due to uh, concerns about the uh, monetary policy in the U.S. So it remains to be seen whether uh, those initial weak signs of recovery can be sustained in the remainder of the year. The risks regarding growth are certainly now on the downside due to these reasons. Do you still like the Turkish model, if I can call it that? Because, you know, the way the Turkish economy has built itself up over particularly the last 10 years, it's been a pretty good example for other countries, the ones which have needed the IMF bailouts, uh, the ones which have emerged from the Arab Spring as well. It's been held up as a good economic model. Do you still like that model? Well, uh, to the extent that that model was in place in terms of the structural reforms and uh, sound banking system, of course, it's a good model. But then uh, the vulnerability uh, to uh, changes in investor sentiment because of Turkey's huge external financing needs uh, has been a problem all along, even uh, during the good times in, in uh, those past 10 years. Uh, and uh, at times of, uh, you know, question marks about the sustainability of global liquidity, sustainability of capital inflows uh, to countries like Turkey, of course, the weak spot of this Turkish model is being exposed. And uh, that's what we are seeing right now. Uh, since uh, the second half of May, uh, we have seen uh, outflows uh, from Turkish economy. Uh, and uh, this has uh, been reflected in the currency and the bond market and in the stock market. And it remains to be seen how fast the Fed will taper off its uh, monetary accommodation and uh, how the Turkish economy's response to that will be. Uh, as I said, uh, the key variable to watch is Turkey's large external financing needs uh, because uh, any concerns on that front will certainly be amplified uh, by, the, uh, by, uh, by the risk sentiment globally and uh, risk sentiment towards Turkey more specifically. Can I get just a final thought on the way that politics and economics go forward from here? Because clearly Prime Minister Erdogan and the AK Party have got some popularity issues here and there is clearly a movement against them. But you also can't forget that 
under that leadership, there have been 10 very, very strong years of economic growth. How does that affect Mr Erdogan's popularity? Will people forget the, the good times? I think people, uh, people give credit to the government for the good times and also investors are giving credit to the government for the good times as well. Uh, I think it's fair to characterize AKP's overall economic policies uh, as a very market friendly and the markets, the investors have certainly rewarded that over the past 10 years. But recent response to these protests and uh, have, uh, have sort of cast doubt on, on perceptions regarding the government on cer certain several levels. Uh, one of them, of course, is the heavy-handed police response to uh, what has gone on, but also the government's response on economic sphere has been less than perfect, I should say. The government has been, uh, has been talking about an interest rate lobby, calling on its supporters to use public banks instead of private banks, and it remains to be seen whether these will cast a permanent shadow uh, on, on AKP's free market credentials, market-friendly credentials. The markets may well take these as words that were, uh, that were used in the heat of the moment and may well forget these later or these may change the perceptions regarding the economic policies in Turkey for good. Uh, as I said, this remains to be seen. This is an open question mark right now and this is an important risk going forward. It, uh, I, think if, uh, I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the response that investors have seen over the past few weeks have been much, much different from the market-friendly face of the government that have been accustomed to for the past 10 years or so. Inan Demir joining us from Istanbul on the state of the Turkish economy. Thank you, Inan. My pleasure. Thank you. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, we're at the Paris Air Show, where it's Boeing versus Airbus again. But who's got the edge right now? We'll look at that a little later on. Now, currency is one of those strange things where strength or weakness can be a good or bad thing, depending on what it is you do. Take Thailand, for instance, where the Thai baht has reached its highest value since the Asian crisis of 1997, and it's got some people worried. A survey of Thai companies showed if the baht rose above 27.9 baht to the dollar, then 10% could go out of business, 12.5% would lay off staff, and 24% felt currency appreciation would hit their profitability. But of even more concern is exports. 75% of Thai GDP comes from exports, and a strong currency makes those less attractive. In fact, exports already fell 5.8% between February 2012 and February 2013, Rice exports, very important, they were down 20.2% and rubber exports 11.8% in the same period. Which explains why government and businesses are pressuring the Bank of Thailand to cut interest rates. Which it did do, just a small cut though, down from 2.75% to 2.5%. But will that be enough to help exporters? Wayne Hay went to meet one exporter and he sent this report. Volatility is a word big business doesn't want to hear in a country driven by exports. Around 60% of Thailand's economy comes from exporting things like processed food. Better Grow turned over $2.1 billion last year, partly by sending fresh and frozen chicken around the world. However, this year, food exports to most markets have been in decline, partly because of a slowdown in global demand. But it's also because of a baht that gained almost 7% against the US dollar, more than any other Asian currency. That meant goods exported from Thailand became more expensive. But Bettergrow says diversity is the key to overcoming price variations. We export to different markets and not so even the currency is okay, our main factor that, in, in, uh, that will affect to our price but because we also supply to Canada, to Asia and to European markets so it can, we can, you know, how we can manage by ourselves. But it's not so easy for small business to be able to absorb the changes. All of the uncertainty means that the growth forecast for food exports this year has been slashed to just one and a half percent. And now importers are being affected by a significantly weakened part, which means they don't have as much purchasing power. This is all about money coming in and going out of the country. Foreign investors had been snapping up Thai stocks and government bonds. Greater demand means a stronger Thai baht. But then they began bailing out, opting instead for other markets around the world. Less demand means a weaker currency. 
Investors were also scared off by speculation about government intervention in the form of capital controls to stem the flow of money. You can do what you want to do to try to alter that trend and maybe you'll create a small blip in the trend but ultimately they come back to what their underlying fundamentals will be in place. Um, I don't see a need for capital controls. The Central Bank of Thailand has warned there could be more volatility ahead, meaning even big business will be keeping a close eye on the money markets. Well, let's look more at this currency issue. Dr. Tithinan Pong Sudirak is from the Institute of Security and International Studies in Bangkok, and he's joining us now. Doctor, in, in your opinion, how much do these currency issues affect Bangkok and Southeast Asia? Thailand is not the only country in the region that has been affected by currency volatility. Uh, the baht has strengthened uh, and peaked uh, in April, but then now it has weakened uh, following a fiscal expansionary program by the government, spending on flood management, spending on uh, uh, populist policies. And now the central bank has lowered the repurchase rate by 25 basis points. So uh, there's some monetary policy relaxation, fiscal policy expansion. The baht has now depreciated uh, to a little bit above 30 baht per dollar. Uh, this is not uncommon. If you look at uh, the region, uh, there has been a lot of volatility. Uh, the ample uh, liquidity, the flush of liquidity from the U.S., uh, Europe, and now Japan with Abenomics uh, has created uh, tension in the currency markets. So those currencies in Europe, uh, in the U.S. and Japan are weakening, and as a result, uh, the currencies in Asia are strengthening. Uh, so it's in line with other currencies. At the same time, the Thai uh, macro economy is, uh, is solid fundamentally. So we have a good uh, trade account uh, figures. We have a good uh, current account surplus. So the underpinnings are very strong for the macro economy. And that's why the baht has been fairly stable, but on the strengthening side. So do you think then that dealing with interest rates is enough, that the government's looked at that, it's taken a cut in interest rates as its approach to this and decided that this will suffice to deal with any currency fluctuations in Thailand? The government is uh, concerned about the strength of the baht because we rely on, uh, as we all do, uh, different locomotives for economic growth. So export growth for Thailand is crucial. But now it, there's a consensus that uh, exports will not grow as much as in the recent years because of the lower demand uh, in other countries in Europe and in Japan and in uh, uh, the U.S. So uh, the, the weakening of the baht temporarily, the depreciation, is going to buy some time. But in the end, uh, we're looking at lower export growth, which means the Thai government will have to boost consumption and investment in order to shoulder, show up uh, Thai economic growth in the medium term. And they're trying to do that with uh, fiscal uh, ex expenditure programs, uh, with the flood management, and with the massive mega uh, infrastructure projects coming online. Yeah, is that part of the problem there, that exports are actually part of the problem here? Because Thailand is so you know, reliant, I'm seeing here a number of 60% is, is the exports there. Uh, and that really the internal economy, the, the, the internal consumption, if you like, that's got to be boosted so there is less reliance on the export market. Yes, uh, the reliance on exports uh, is common in Thailand and also in other East Asian countries. These are export-driven economies. But over the years, uh, there has been a, an attempt uh, in Thailand and elsewhere to try to uh, rebalance uh, export growth with domestic demand. So the idea uh, from this government is to boost consumption, boost spending power of the consumers so that uh, a, a more consumption-driven growth can be promoted and the reliance on export growth can be reduced. Uh, they're looking for a better balance in order to rely less on the vicissitudes and volatility of external markets. So we want to rely more on the internal market uh, going forward. You've, in the course of this interview, referred to this government a few times. So why don't you give me your view on this government and what's happened since Prime Minister Ying Luck Shinawat came into power and the path that she and her party appear to be taking Thailand down now? To understand Ying Lak, we have to know that she is a proxy, a clone of her brother Thaksin. Uh, these populist policies that we see from her government, the car rebates, the um, increases in uh, salaries and wages, the, the, the home rebates, and, and also the flood management programs, uh, the expenditures for infrastructure, these are policies that came from her brother to try to boost consumption, boost domestic demand in order to 
uh, rebalance the Thai economy, to rely less on the export market, and also, of course, to win the votes. Uh, these uh, policies cater to the electorate uh, in the countryside, uh, the poor in the urban areas. Uh, so it's a, it's a gamble for Thailand. Uh, Ying Luck is trying to survive. Uh, her government has been elected uh, by a convincing majority, but she's under uh, attack from all sides, from the toxins, uh, enemies and opponents. Uh, so it's very difficult for her to, uh, to stand her ground and govern at the same time. Uh, we're coming up to two years now, almost half the, of the term. So far, she's still in power, but at the same time, she's also uh, being undermined and uh, embattled from different fronts. The rice pledging scheme is uh, under attack. It's also losing a lot of uh, uh, baht. You know, it's been a p policy disaster in many ways, resulting in heavy losses. So the government now, midway, uh, has to make some policy adjustments. And Ying Lak has to somehow uh, win some compromises with uh, her brother's opponents and enemies. And somehow Thailand has to uh, maneuver and navigate the next two years, uh, certainly at least until the next election. Uh, there are rumors in Thailand that we might have another military coup, that the Ying Lak government will be overthrown in some way in the streets or by the, by the judiciary. Uh, that's what we don't want to see in Thailand. Uh, the policy platform is, um, is moving ahead. I think it's, uh, it's risky. It has some uh, gamble in it, but overall uh, it's a way forward. Uh, there's no other alternatives. So somehow we have to find a way to um, stick with the democratic system and the government has to be flexi flexible and adjustable to its policy mistakes and then Thai economy can, can grow into the medium term and somehow Thailand can consolidate its democracy uh, at that time. Dr. Titian Pong Surirak from the Institute of Security and International Studies in Bangkok. We thank you very much for your time. Right to the Paris Air Show and the old battle lines have been drawn again between Boeing and Airbus. The latter fired the first shot before the show opened, test flying the A350, that's the challenger to Boeing's 787 Dreamliner. And both manufacturers racked up more than $100 billion in sales in Paris. Our business editor, Abid Ali, was there. He spoke to Airbus's chief executive, Fabrice Pregier, and began by asking whether Airbus could deliver that A350 on time. Let's say that we achieved a very important milestone. Then, of course, uh, there are some risks remaining. Uh, we have uh, 2,500 hours flight tests uh, to carry out before certification and then first deliveries. And uh, we will work very hard to deliver the first aircraft to Qatar Airways with our launch customers. Just give us an understanding as to why it is difficult to bring the big projects in on time. We're looking at the A380 behind us and that had problems. Yeah. Boeing had these very public uh, problems as well. What, well. What's the issue there? A couple of reasons. First of all, we stretch the technologies to the maximum because we want this aircraft to be state of the art 10, 15 years, 20 years after entry into service. This is what we did, for instance, with the A320. Uh, second, this is huge. A research and development. This is an investment above 10 billion euros, so uh, 13 billion dollars. And uh, you imagine that we have more than 10,000 engineers working on this project. So uh, we have plenty of reasons uh, to uh, fail. And uh, uh, the focus has to be on project management, risk management, making sure the top management has the appropriate transparency. And I have personally invested a lot in this program. So you say you invested a lot, but what does this actually mean for a continent like Europe, which has been hit by austerity? What does it mean for that? Well, for Airbus, <laughs> it doesn't mean much because our market is global. Mm. Uh, we export our production around the globe. And uh, if we take the Middle East, this is a very, very active and very growing area, or Asia or China, uh, and even uh, America and Europe start to replace their old fleets. So what counts for us uh, is the growth uh, of uh, the global uh, worldwide GDP. So we are not linked to the Eurozone and we are very pleased with that. <laughs> okay, so but it's important for jobs, right? Because you are providing some hope for jobs in this uh, area. Sure, we have a global supply mm. chain, but you are right. Mm. Uh, we are well established in Europe. And so for the last uh, uh, two years, uh, we have recruited uh, 10,000 people just in the Airbus perimeter and the supply chain uh, has a potential of a factor of four or five. But we are growing everywhere and uh, we have procured a lot, for instance, from uh, the United States. 613 planes, that's how many you sold so far. How many more do you want to sell? That's a pretty good number for something that's just flown. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, we are addressing the market of both the 787 and the 777. 
And uh, this is a market of more than 6,000 aircraft. And I, I would set a target uh, which is about half of it. So let's say that the potential of this uh, family of aircraft is about 3,000. Okay, and um, the A380 that we see uh, looking behind us, uh, you spent in the region of 12 billion, you expect to break even by 2015. Yes. Um, this is another huge investment. When do you hope to break even on that? Well, first of all, you can see the next British Airways uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, it's a marvelous aircraft. Uh, if you take Emirates, they are very pleased with it. Uh, so uh, uh, this is what counts for us. This is long-term prospect. You are right uh, to say that uh, we expect the break-even uh, in 2015, and then gradually we will uh, uh, make money with this aircraft. So uh, this is what you learn in this business. Huge investments, very long-term uh, profitability, but uh, uh, I'm sure the F380 will be a very good success uh, for Airbus, uh, especially uh, after 2020, because we'll see a lot of mega cities mm -hmm. growing and they will need such an aircraft because uh, their uh, airports will be congestioned and they will need bigger aircraft. This is the trend of the market. It's a big bet though, isn't it? Because you expect this to be about 40 to 50 percent of your market share. Yes, that's right, but uh, I think we can make it. Fabrice Brashir, thank you very much for your time. You know, Airbus took a good 25 years to become a serious competitor in aviation. And that was in no small part due to John Leahy, the company's chief salesman, referred to as the trillion dollar man. He joined Airbus in 1985. Here's his take on the company's rise and the industry as a whole. The industry is just so much bigger. You think about it, this industry, since the dawn of the jet age, has doubled every 15 years in size. So back in 1985, when I joined the company in January of 85 in the US, uh, a, a lot of people just didn't even know who Airbus was. In fact, uh, more than a few airlines asked me if I was actually selling those people movers that went from the terminal out to the airplane. And I had to explain, no, no, we actually manufacture wide-body aircraft. Well, if you take that period, 15 years later, the industry was twice as large. Then 15 years later, to where we are today, it was twice as large again. So in 1985, it was a quarter of the size it is today. Now, while Airbus has managed to sell upwards of 600 of those A350s, Boeing's been fighting a PR battle over its 787 Dreamliner. They were grounded for months over an issue with faulty batteries. Boeing's Randy Tinseth explains here what they've done to combat it. In total, we spent 300,000 hours of both work and testing to get that airplane back in the air. So we did this in three months. So at times we had five or 600 people working on this issue. And it wasn't just people at Boeing. We also found experts from around the industry and around the world to bring their expertise to make sure that we had the right solution as we look into the future. And while there have certainly been concerns over the Dreamliner, they're not shared by all in the industry. Qatar Airways, for example, which operates five Dreamliners right now. Here's Qatar's CEO Akbar al Baka speaking to Abid Ali. We're standing behind your sixth 787. Have you got faith in the products? I have absolute faith. Otherwise, I would uh, be rest assured I would never accept uh, to uh, take the delivery of this airplane. It's a fine airplane. It's a revolutionary product. And in my opinion, this will be really the winner. Every new aircraft program will have problems. And this is one of them. If you look at the problems 380 got, if you look at the problems uh, 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 777 got. You know, uh, 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 777 had more problems than the 787, but nobody heard it because it was at the age where internet was not there, Facebook was not there, Twitter was not there, you know, and all this uh, social media garbage, yeah. uh, you know, creates a perception of people which is really opposite to what it should be. So, um, when, you, when you look at the aircraft, you said before, and you've been quite vocal about it, that this plane should never have been grounded. I am again insisting that this plane should have never been grounded. It was a wrong reaction and uh, I was proven right. You know, it's already flying uh, uh, thousands of hours already since its uh, uh, recertification. And you didn't have any problem. Yeah. It was just an isolated problem with two batteries. But aren't you worried you that, know, that... You know, you, you recall uh, sometimes three, four million cars because there was a small uh, hitch in the car. But you don't uh, tell the entire world cars now you have to stop because we have to fix fire you know this uh, one million car 
But aren't you worried that they haven't been able to recreate that battery problem that the ones caught the caught fire? Even if they did not recreate, and actually that is even vindicates what I'm saying. If they couldn't recreate, means there is no problem. Okay, we'll accept that. <laughs> Okay, but you're going to be now the launch customer for the A350 as well. Yes, and I'm very delighted to receive this A350. I can't wait for it. Are you ready for problems with that plane as well? Uh, well, I'm sure that uh, Airbus has nearly a year of solving the problems. They will have a very aggressive uh, flying program. Uh, and what is very important is that uh, Airbus is at an advantage. They have learned all the problems from the uh, 787s. Mm and I don't think they were repeated. Okay, that's a pretty uh, brave call to make. Yes. So you expect that plane in the late 2014 then? Uh, yes, and I'm absolutely confident that it will be a great aeroplane. The next thing is the 777X. Do you want Boeing to deliver on that? Yes, I want uh, Boeing to deliver on that. It will be an absolutely amazing aeroplane. It will be a product evolution from the 350, the 787-8, the 350-900, uh, the 350-1000 and, of course, uh, eventually the 777-8X. Uh, never short on a word, is he, Akbar al -Bakar there. That is our show for this week. Plenty more for you online, though, at aljazeera.com slash business, the latest business headlines, plus all our previous episodes for you to catch up on. And then you can get in touch with either me, at Kamal AJE on Twitter, uh, our business editor, who you saw there, at Abid Oliver Ali, or drop us an email, countingthecost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.